Earth to mom, earth to mom. That's what my sisters and I used to say. We need our mom's attention. You see, my mother was an introvert. She was often in her own world, and you had to get her attention if you wanted to ask her something. If, if earth to mom didn't work, we'd always say, Mrs. Grenade, I have a question. You see, my mom was a school teacher, and she did answer to Mrs. Grenade often. It wasn't really that she was trying to ignore us. It's just that she was focused on other things. I inherited that trait, unfortunately. Sometimes you have to call my name to get my attention. I, I get lost in my own little world. It's not that I don't want to pay attention, but rather that I'm focused on other things. The reality is sometimes I focus too intently on one thing and everything else is out the window. Where is your attention this morning? If we were living in normal times, our attention would be scattered. We would have our work, we'd have our families, we'd have whatever we're trying to entertain ourselves with. But in this time of COVID outbreak, our attention, I think, is even more scattered. I think about those poor moms and dads who have had to become the teachers for their kids. Not only are they working and doing their jobs and cleaning the house and making the food, now they're also teaching the children. And I think about those poor teachers who are having to work twice as hard to get lessons online. I saw a t-shirt this week online that was a Dr. Seuss t-shirt. It had the cat and the hat on it, and it said, I will teach you in a room. I will teach you on Zoom. I will teach you in your house. I will teach you with my mouse. I will teach you here and there. I will teach you because I care. Our attention is scattered in lots of different places. It reminds me of the days of the early Christians. When Peter is writing to the scattered church, their attention is also scattered because their minds are on the threat. Nero has begun persecution in Jerusalem and many Christians and Jews have been scattered throughout the world. They're trying to get their lives back together. They're trying to escape from that persecution. There is such great unknown. When there's a threat, it gets our attention. It, it makes us focus on all of the negative. It, it makes us focus on all of what is wrong in life. And amidst this, Peter writes the church and he says, change your focus. Focus on Easter. Focus on the power of the resurrection. Easter focuses us back on hope. You see, Peter understood what it was like to lose hope. Peter had seen his Lord die. Peter had denied even knowing Jesus and he was in deep, deep despair at one point. And then Easter happened. Christ rose from the dead and his hope was restored. And Peter remembered Jesus' words that you shall be my witnesses. And Peter and the other disciples refocused onto the work of the gospel. This past week on a Facebook post, I told you about one of my favorite stained glass pictures here in our church. It is right over here on my right and on it it has both the crucifixion and the resurrection they go together and they're in the same window in that same pane on different frames you see if jesus had simply died and had not been raised back to life he probably would have been forgotten with time but if he had not died and given his life there would not have been the opportunity for the resurrection, for Jesus to come forth in new life and promise to us the gift of eternal life. Sometimes we focus so much on our troubles and our despairs when Jesus calls us and through our gospel this morning in Peter, he calls us to focus on our hope and our future. That he who has power over death has power to give us new life. It's hard, however, to focus in the midst of a storm. 
Have you ever been afraid, really afraid? I can remember perhaps one of the times I was most afraid in my life. It had started off as a wonderful, beautiful day. My father was being honored by his church for serving 20 years. And I wanted to go down for a special dinner they were having for him. I was in North Carolina, and that was in Georgia. And I had been talking about, I wish I could go, but I had to preach that morning. And one of my church members said, Pastor, I'll get my pilot to fly you down. He had a plane, just a very small plane. And he arranged for his pilot to actually fly me after church down to Warner Robins, Georgia, down to where my father was having the celebration. I flew down. It was a great time. I was able to be there. I was able to see friends, to celebrate with our family. And then we got back late that afternoon into that plane, and we took off to come back to North Carolina. About halfway through that flight, the sky turned gray, and then it turned almost black. The wind was coming. There was hell we were flying through, and and there was lightning cracking all around us, and I was so afraid. And I thought, Nelson, quit looking at the storm. Just look over at the pilot. He's been here before. He knows what this is like, and it'll be all right. Just look at him, and you will be encouraged. So I looked over at the pilot, and his knuckles were white there on the stick. And he was shaking. And he looked back at me and he said, don't look at me, pray, you're the preacher. I was looking at the wrong person. I needed to look to God for salvation through that. And so I prayed, Lord, if you ever get me out of this plane, I'll never get in another one of these old planes. I actually have. I enjoy flying. But I'll never forget that day in which the pilot said, we've got to find a place to land. We've got to get out of this. We've got to find safety. Pray, Nelson, pray. We have all been called together in this time of crisis to pray and to seek God's face. And I love what God says through Peter. He says that better days are ahead to take our focus off of the day in which we are living. Peter writes to that early church, and he says, oh, you may have troubles and trials and tribulations for a little while, but they will not last. You have an inheritance which is kept for you in heaven, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is already being revealed in the last times. God is at work even in our darkest days. As Fleetwood Mac used to sing, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop. It'll soon be here. It'll be here better than before. Yesterday's gone. Yesterday's gone. I used to listen to that song and I used to think, but, but when? When will it get here? How long, O oh Lord? Till things get better. When I say that thing, I, I think about kids in the back seat of a car. If you've ever been on a long trip with kids, you know what they ask. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much longer? When will we get there? Can we stop and get something to eat? And you try to distract them, you focus them on other things. Oh, today they have electronics to look at. When I was growing up, we had to count the cows. To look at anything else. Have you ever been on those journeys? Have you ever been in a car on a journey that got scary? Several years ago, I had the privilege of going out west with a group of Boy Scouts. I was one of the leaders. We had about 40 kids with us. And while we were out there, we actually got to go up Pike's Peak. We went up the Incline Railroad. And as we went up, they told us that on the other side that there was actually a road that went up to Pike's Peak as well. We all started talking, oh, we wish we had driven up that road. And everybody around there said, you don't want to drive up that road. 
there are no guardrails and it's very, very steep. It's a dangerous road. Well, we came back down the incline railroad and we got down and one of the kids had left a pair of glasses up on top of the mountain. His father, Ronnie, said, I'll drive up there and get them. And I said, oh, I'll go with you. I want to go back up that peak and I really want to go on that road. And so we took turns driving up the Pikes Peak Road. There's 156 turns in that road. It climbs 4,721 feet. It has an average grade of 7%. You have to stop going up and take a breath or else you'll get altitude sickness. On the way down, you have to stop time and time again to let your brakes cool. The kids that were with us, my son and Ronnie's son, kept looking over and saying, Hey, Dad, look, look right down the side here. You know it's a cliff right there? If we fell off, we'd just tumble forever. I didn't look down the cliff when I was driving. I was looking at the road. I knew the danger. But I knew I just needed to look at the very next curve and keep on my side of the road. See, we'd already been up to the top of that mountain once. And we knew that when we got there, it would be beautiful again. You see, trials don't last forever. The road is not always rough. My grandmother used to say something, probably the same thing your grandmother used to say. If you ever talked to her about your trouble, she'd say, this too shall pass. When I was growing up, I thought that must be in the Bible somewhere. I mean, grandmother always quoted the Bible. But the Bible does not say this too shall pass. But time and time again in Scripture, we find the phrase, and it will come to pass. In Scripture, it's not just about something going away. It is about God making new things happen. Have you been watching a lot of TV when you've been homebound? Maybe you've been streaming different shows. Some time ago, Valerie and I streamed a show called Call the Midwife. It's a PBS show made by BBC. It takes place in the east end of London in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. It's about some Anglican nuns and some nurses that work with them. They're in a house called the Nanatas House. They're midwives, and their job is there in a town called Poplar to go out and to help the women birth their children. It's a very poor neighborhood. It's a difficult situation. And midwives go out time and time again, and they find all sorts of difficulties. But they keep going, and they keep caring. In every single episode, at some point, you hear one of those midwives say something like this to that mother in the midst of birth. You're doing wonderfully. This baby will be here soon. You're almost there. Keep it up. In the midst of our most difficult moments, God can birth something beautiful and new within us. When we go through this time of crisis and come out on the other side, both as a church, as a community, as a country, and as a world, what will have been birthed that is new? Will we just forget this time? Or will we remember that life is sacred? Will we remember to love one another? Will we remember that all of the boundaries between us that this virus seems to make us equal again Will we remember that, that we were all created in God's image? You see, these trials can strengthen our faith. They can serve us for the good. Yes, it is tempting to become inwardly focused, to just care about ourselves, to just think about our own people, our own church. Some years ago, I wrote an article for a leadership magazine. I entitled it, Pastor our concierge. And I talked about that it's tempting for us who are pastors to act like a hotel concierge, to just serve those who are in our church. We're a codependent lot. 
We like to make people happy. We want them to be happy. But it's not just about us or our church. These times like this COVID crisis tend to knock us out of our usual patterns. And that can be a good thing. Rarely do we change unless we are forced to change. Have you heard the old joke about how many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Why, my father gave us that light bulb years ago. You can't change that light bulb. But churches do change. Our church is changing through this time. And some of those changes are difficult as we cannot be together. But others of those changes are good. And God is helping us to reach even more people. I've talked to many of my pastor friends, and they're finding the same experience. That since we've been forced online, we are actually reaching more people than we were just in our churches. Last week at Easter, we had viewers in California and Washington State. I can't imagine that we would have those before this. Churches are learning how to work in other patterns. Melissa talked to you this morning about the children and how she's ministering to them even though she cannot be present with them. We are reaching out to others. I read an article this week where Eddie Hammett said that God was taking the one church and creating thousands of home churches. When the early church got started, it was home churches before we ever came together. We can learn how to do things differently. I remember when I was a kid, I had a friend who was ambidextrous. He could do things with his left hand, his right hand, it didn't matter. Mainly he was a switch hitter in baseball. He could hit from either side of the plate and change with the pitcher. I once asked him, did you have this just naturally? And he said, oh no. He said, when I was really little, I broke my right arm. I'm right-handed naturally. And I had to learn to do things with my left hand and my left arm as well. When my right arm healed, I just kept doing it with both. And that's the way I learned. You see, we can learn how to do things new. God is always creating newness in us. When we really want to grow, when we want to grow strong, we have to change some things. When I go and work out and work out with weights occasionally, I always remember what an instructor told me. He said that you're actually breaking down muscle when, when you're working out. You're actually making little, fi little fibrous fissures in there. And then when you heal, they grow back together stronger than they were. We can grow stronger even in this crisis. But that growth just doesn't happen. It happens only when we make right choices and right decisions. Another thing that my grandmother used to say to me, and my parents said it as well, when you don't know what to do, just do the next right thing. It's an old saying that's been around for a long, long time. But our children will know it because they've listened to it sung over and over in the movie Frozen 2. In that movie, Anna is descending into depression. She sings, I've never seen dark before. I have, I have seen dark before, but not like this. This is cold. This is empty. This is numb. The life I knew is over. The lights are out. Hello, darkness. I'm ready to succumb. It's a very dark, dark message in the midst of a Disney movie. And she is facing uncertainty. Her beloved sister Elsa is gone and seems to have been lost. Olaf, the snowman that was created by Elsa's magic, has simply melted away. In the midst of her despair, Anna sings, Just do the next right thing. Take a step, step again. It is all that I can do. The next right thing. I won't look too far ahead. It's too much for me to take. But break it down to the next breath, this next step, this next choice is one I can make. Christine Bell, who is the singer of that song, talks about going through times of depression. When it was if she could not get out of bed, and for her the next right thing was to simply get up. 
And then the next right thing was to eat breakfast. And the next right thing was to brush her teeth. The next right thing was to make a list of things she had to do that day. In the midst of this time we're all going through, what is the next right thing for us? Maybe the next right thing is to actually stay at home like we've been asked to do. Or to wear a mask when we go out. Or to go to work if we're an essential worker. Or to pick up the phone and call someone who needs some encouragement. To buy some extra food when we are out and to make that as a donation to those who are in need. To write a check or to give online. Or maybe the next right thing for this time in which we are forced into solitude and silence is to use this time to examine our own lives and to ask God, what is it in us that might need to change? And to learn to trust God. For in the midst of all this, Peter is writing and trying to remind those early Christians as we are reminded as well it is all in God's loving, gracious hands. It's often been said, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Alston Krauss in the song, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow says, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. Or as that great, Easter hymn says to us, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still the calm assurance this child can face on certain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Our focus can be all over the place this morning. But Easter calls us to focus on the gift of eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to come now to a time of invitation. This is a time when we ask people to examine their hearts and minds and if you've never given your life to Christ, to pray a prayer and ask him into your heart or to give us a call and let us walk you through that. Maybe you'd like to become a part of First Baptist Church of States where you've been watching us online and you say, I'd like to be a part of that church. Give us a call. We'd like to receive you into our church. I've heard of a number of churches that actually had people join during this time of online services. We're going to sing another great hymn, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. In it we hear the words, When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Would you sing this song with us wherever you are and let this be your commitment in this time?